Hello and welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders. This is the show where I interviewed the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today I'm delighted to be joined by two incredibly inspirational and thought-provoking leaders. They are Deborah Rue of Rue Global Impact and Lamondra Pugh of Rue Global Impact. Both have really moved the dial when it comes to many different aspects of diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity, with a real focus around cultural change, accessibility, disability inclusion and really helping organizations thrive and drive sustainable long-term change. I'm thrilled to have both here because not only does Deborah and Lamondra have unique personal stories, they really do refuse to accept the status quo and the usual business and passion uh, is at the heart and center of everything that they do and their unshakable faith in the power of human potential cannot be underestimated and welcome to the show uh, Deborah and Lamondra. Thank you for having us. Yeah we're excited about this Leila. (laughs) I'm excited because I was like, oh my goodness, I could actually talk for probably a full podcast on introducing how you both came to be respectively where you are today. But for our listeners who perhaps don't know you as well as I I, I know you both, perhaps, Deborah, we start with you. You could just tell us a little bit about the story of how you came to be uh, where we are today and, you know, working with Lamondra. And we we then, um, Lamondra will come, come to you and get into the nuts and bolts of the session. Well, thank you. And thank you for the work that you do as well, because it's going to take all of us really being determined and being very deliberate about inclusion to to really to really change the world in a way that works for more people. So we're very proud to partner with you, Layla. We really are. And we, we appreciate the work that you're doing. So as you said, my name is Deborah Rue, and I I actually came from the banking industry. I was an executive in the banking industry for for 25 plus years. And during that time, I had two two children. I have a um, daughter and a son that are now grown. And our our eldest, my daughter, I have a, she was born with Down syndrome, and she they told us that she had Down syndrome when she was four months old, which is unusual. They usually uh, tell you that someone has Down syndrome before they're born, or certainly right at birth. But they did not diagnose my daughter till she was four months old, which I really think was a blessing because by the time they told me this potentially devastating news, I already knew this, this child. And I already was convinced she was the best thing ever. So, but she, she, uh, you know, my, that right away we started being told what she couldn't do. People would look at me with pity in their eyes because my daughter had disabilities and things like that. So I navigated that. I didn't listen to people and I, you know, I just really wanted to make a difference for her. But when she was in middle school, once again, I started hearing how she could add no value to society. She could add no value to the workforce. And I thought this is ridiculous. Why not? She actually has a lot of things to add to the workforce. I was just puzzled by it. And so I decided to become an entrepreneur to create a company that would employ people with disabilities because I didn't understand why society wasn't including people with disabilities in the workforce, but that was early 2000. And so then I had to decide what we were going to do for a living. I've always been a technologist. I've always been um, a trainer. And, and so I decided to focus on accessibility because at the time in 2001, it was becoming a big deal in the United States. But I also had the pleasure of meeting a, a lot of amazing people in my life, but LaMondre was one of them. And LaMondre worked with me at my old firm, which was called Tech Access. It was a made-up name, technology and accessibility. And I remember being um, sort of puzzled by LaMondre. So I was sort of set it up for LaMondre to go next. Uh, But 
I, I just thought Lamondre was so talented and I thought he had so much to offer and he was in the workforce at the time, but he was, he was as often happens, he was uh, horribly underemployed. And I, I just saw such a talented man and I didn't understand why once again, society wasn't making sure that we have room for people like Lamandre and others. And so I am a person with an invisible disability, according to the definitions. I have um, ADHD and I, like so many others, I suffer with anxiety and depression. My daughter now is 33 years old. Um, she lives away from home in a supported apartment. And sadly, my husband of many years has acquired late stage dementia because as we age, we also acquire disabilities. It's not meant as a threat. It's just part of being this beautiful biological human beings that we're part of. So that's what started my journey. And I'm really pleased with everything that has unfolded since, but it's, you know, to me, my story is tied very in a lot of ways to Lamandre's story. So let me turn the microphone over to him. Absolutely. First of all, Layla, thank you again. Uh, for allowing us to be a part of this of this platform and it, and it really is amazing to see the work that you all are doing and just honored to be a part of that well as deborah said our, our stories are very similar uh in that I, I am a person with a disability as well i have spinal muscular atrophy now you might not be able to tell it by looking or listening to this to this podcast right now but i can't use anything from my neck down so basically, I rely on people to feed me, to bathe me, to get me up in the mornings. In other words, to carry on my activities of daily living. And when I was first diagnosed at 18 months, the prognosis given to my single teenage mom was that I would not live to be five years old. And if I did live beyond that, in their words, I would be a complete vegetable. This, these are the words of the professionals. Uh, and, um, you know, so they told my mom to, uh, to put me away and uh, just to live her life because I would only serve to complicate her life. Well, I thank God that I have a very stubborn mother because she was like, nope, can't do that. So what do we do now? And they said, well, what have you been doing? She said, I've been loving him. And they said, well, that's what you do. You take him home and you love him. And my mother always taught me that no matter how much time we had, no matter what it was, that I had a responsibility of being a decent human being. I had the responsibility of offering the value that I could and allow my potential to be realized and offer that value to the rest of the world. And that's how I grew up. And when I was 18, I experienced severe culture shock because I went out into the world and I realized, wait a minute, the world does not see me the same way that my mother does. What, what's going on here? And that's when I really became politically active and really became an advocate, not only for myself, but for other people with disabilities. And when I was in college, I got involved with what is called the Center for Independent Living, which is a center, um, an organization that helps people with disability live their lives as independently as they choose to. And I became the lead advocate there. And then I got, I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what? That's great that working with people with disabilities and, and we're becoming more independent and all that kind of good stuff. But we also need to work on the outside in order to get the rest of the world ready for all this independence that we're bringing to the table. And so that's when I started working outside of the disability community. And again, experienced severe culture shock because I realized that employment was a barrier, that accessible, affordable housing was a barrier, that attitudes was actually the biggest barrier that people with disabilities faced and started working uh, in corporate America. And honestly, it was my stint in corporate America that I was able to meet Deborah, and that's how we connected. Uh, and actually what it was is I was working for a retailer, for a large retailer, and I created, and I was actually selling computers is what my actual position was. I was a computer salesman. But while I was there, I started thinking, well, what could we do to make this experience better for people overall? So I created an access initiative for customers and for employees, which did really well. Um, uh, it was my work along with the work of many others, but the company was recognized for that. And I was speaking at a conference and that's when I met Deborah. And honestly, uh, since that connection happened, our worlds have changed. I think both of our worlds have changed quite significantly uh, as a result of that. And we've been working together to help improve not only the plight of the community of people with disabilities, 
but honestly to make the world better because when you include people with disabilities, when you make things accessible for people with disabilities, you improve the state of everyone. And that's uh, that's what that's the work we're, that we're involved in. That's the work that we do. Wow, wow, and wow. You are both such kindred spirits. And I can feel through the computer screen the incredible energy and passion. I can actually physically feel it. I know that might sound weird <laughs> because no. we're in very different places across the pond, as my American husband uh, would say. But I can feel the passion, the energy, the drive and the, the lack of tolerance in a good way for accepting the norm in inverted commas. And what I love about what you have both said is ultimately you just don't understand why others would not get this. And it comes from that personal place, that personal place deeper than almost words can explain. And that is, is love. It's love of the family, it's love of humanity, it's the need, the want, the willingness to really change business and wider society for for good. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And Layla, I will tell you, it, it, it is the love for humanity. And you love humanity enough to make humanity uncomfortable with the status quo and stand up and say, you know what, if we're going to grow, we're going to have to stretch. And that stretch means that we're gonna to have to challenge conventional ways of thinking in order to elevate our lives. Mm -hmm. And this is absolutely it. When people say, well, this has got nothing to do with me. What you both have described is the fact that you lift those with a visible or invisible disability up you help lift up all the other aspects. And ultimately, um, you know, Deborah, as you said, to start with, we all are going to get older. And as we get older, more likelihood of disability, whether visible or invisible, to happen. And so it is completely selfish not to consider what will happen by nature a lot of the time. Um, I love that you both shared your personal story as well. And I know you've heard little of mine previously, and that is that I am dyslexic and I was adopted by white British parents who are incredible. I have them to thank for so, so many things. But I feel this, this similarity with you both, and that is that there is no victim mentality. There is no, well, you know, there's the dyslexia or there's the disability or there's the, you know, it's just that power of using this as a strength and turning that right around. And I just think that is beautiful and into itself really, because um, each and every single one of us have a part to play when it comes to diversity, inclusion, belonging. And you know, I think almost equity actually, uh, Lamondra, when you talk there, you know, about kind of, uh, e you know, e equality, you know, we, we all have equal rights to live on this planet and to breathe air and to, um, you know, to do what we do. But actually, it's an understanding of the fact that people do start from different places in life. I, I wanted to tell you, may give you, uh, I wanted to give you a comment um, that Lamandre, a conversation that Lamandre and I had that I think is very important into the conversation. It was very important to me. I said to Lamandre, when, I've known Lamandre for many years, and I said to him one time, and I knew how I meant this. I meant this in a very respectful, loving way. But I said to Lamandre, you know, Lamandre, when I see you, when I interact with you, I don't see your disability at all. I don't see it at all. I, I just, I see 
an accomplished man. I see um, somebody that can add so much value to the workforce. I see somebody that's very good for our multinational corporations that are trying to figure out how to include everyone, including people with disabilities. And Lamandre, um, as a matter of fact, I will let Lamandre tell you what he said to me. And it was a, it was very, very eye-opening for me because I hadn't thought about it from this perspective. So I just thought this was something that would add to the conversation, Layla. So Lamandre, let me turn it over to you. Absolutely. Well, when, when Deborah said those things to me, I expressed to her that I understand exactly the spirit in which you gave that the spirit in which you shared those feelings. But the issue is, I need you to see my disability. Because here's the reality. My disability is not the defining point, but it's certainly a defining point. It, it is a part of who I am. It is a part of my makeup. It is a part of how I see the world. It is part of the lens through which I filter my reality. And so to say I don't see my, your disability is to say you don't see all of me. And the truth is, when I come to the table, I bring all of me to that table. So I bring the talent, I bring the accomplishments, I bring the value, but I'm also bringing that disability, just like I brought the fact that I'm a black man, just like I brought the fact that I am a black man raised in the South or the Southern part of the United States. All of that comes to the table with me and all of it is valuable because it shaped my perspective of the world. And the flip side of that would be like me saying, Layla, when I see you, I see someone who's smart. I see someone who's bright. I see someone who brings value. I don't see a woman. Good and point. that that example, when you when you really kind of change the emphasis, it becomes clear then because somehow in our society, we have built up the concept that there is something wrong, inherently wrong with disability, that it means broken, that it means missing, that it means incomplete, that it means less valuable, that it means inferior. But the truth is, it simply means diversity. It is a part of who I am. It is a part of what makes me unique. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. It's so powerful to hear you describe this. And it reminds me of a conversation I had with the CEO of the Special Olympics. And she said, we've been talking a lot with our athlete leaders with their IDs about looking at our um, ability, not our disability. And what you say there, Lamondra, rings so much truth in what they have said because it is the genuine whole self you know there's one thing saying or hearing in the corporates oh bring your full self to work it's like hello until I actually do and I I don't understand how to your point Lamondra when people say oh I don't see color I don't see race my kids don't see it. And I kind of, I think, well, yeah, on the one hand, that perhaps does come from a good place. I think there is concern over vilification almost when it comes to doing or saying the wrong thing. But of course you see it if you have eyesight, right? And you're, you're right. Why should we not see that as a superpower, basically. Right. It's, I don't know whether I'm making very much sense here. Maybe it's my dyslexia, <laughs> but it is it's the multifaceted strengths that, that you have. It's not just that you are, it's the intersectional pieces. You're not just a black man. Um, you are a black man from Southern America who has a disability, which is actually a superpower because it allows you to think differently and, 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 and. Right. And the same for Deborah, who, Absolutely. I mean, where do I start, Deborah, with you? I'm kind of like, oh my goodness, 
I, I've got a million questions to ask. I don't even know where to start because there's so many multi-dimensional layers to you as a person, you as a mother, you as a carer, you as a wife, and so on and so forth. Why do we see diversity as something which is so one-dimensional? Right, right. I, I think we, and, and as long as we continue to do that, we're going to continue to not allow people to really tap into their full potential. And why do we care if people tap into their full potential? Well, you should care about it as an employer. I know I'm a business owner and an entrepreneur, and I need my employees to think out of the, so the box, to be creative, to be innovative, to really be there in, in a really um, empowering way for our clients that are trying to figure this out. And our clients, and the same thing with what you're doing at Dial Global, the reality is we're asking, I, it's sort of amusing in a way, um, we're asking corporations to solve our biggest societal problems. Now, society doesn't know how to solve them, but we're saying, but regardless, well, I know we don't know what we're doing over here in society, but corporations, you need to solve these problems. You need to hire a diverse workforce. And I was on a show and I was talking to a professor in Berkeley. Uh, she was on the panel as well. And she made a comment. This was during, in the United States last year, when we were really, um, we were walking the Black Lives Matter, but in a horrific way, you know, beautiful young man is jogging down the road and, you know, white guys with guns think, you know, obviously he needs to die because he's black. You know, we George Floyd is killed in front of us, murdered in the streets. And that was another time when I went to LaMondre and said, LaMondre, I don't understand what's happening. And he's like, Deborah, I love you, but I actually have to I have to do, I have to almost process myself before I can come and help you. And I had another friend say the same thing. But so during these very intense times, you know, taking a look at all this, and she had made a comment, which I agreed with. Um, and I know this is something that you're trying to help corporations wrap their hands around as well. But she made a comment that uh, corporations that she's dealing with, that they should hire as many brown and black people as possible. And by the way, okay, that's a great comment. Now I would add to that comment and hire as many qualified brown and black people as possible. But I would also say, but let's take a look at a little bit different as well. Instead of focusing on one group at a time, when we had the Me Too movement that we see happening in other countries now, um, we were really focused on women. And I, by the way, as a woman, I want you to focus on us. When we're in the United States, killing black people in the, our streets, whoa. Well, let, let's do the right thing by brown and black people. But I think looking at the intersectionalities is a, is a more powerful way to look at it. So yes, please hire as many brown and black people as possible. But look at the intersectionalities. Can you hire brown and black people that are women and brown and black people that are part of the LGBT and that are part of the disability community? Let's be more deliberate about, once again, as you both were saying, our whole selves, bringing our whole selves. And, and we're really blessed to work with gigantic multinational corporations. And we always are saying to them, we want you hiring people with disabilities and diverse communities, qualified, of course. Um, and the reason why I keep using the word qualified, Layla, is because unfortunately in our community, because of all the communities, uh, the community of people with disabilities have been left out the most, period. And we have a major identity problem, which LaMondre and I are going to give an announcement later before we uh, go, go off air. And this will be the first time we've announced this. We want to announce it on your show, Layla. But... Um, we, we, we think it's very important to be very deliberate in these things right now. But I, I'm an author. I've written multiple books. My last book was called Inclusion Branding. And I, um, of course, needed an editor. And I, my editor said, every time you say this one thing, you say the same thing and it's unnecessary. I would say, please hire qualified people with disabilities. And she said, that's just assumed, Deborah. Everybody's going to assume that. And I said, and she said, but you say it every time in the book, qualified qualified. Why do you keep repeating yourself? And by the way, it's unnecessary. And I said, well, unfortunately it is necessary to say that because unfortunately what the community of people with disabilities often are saying to employers, you need to include us. You need to create jobs for us. You need to do whatever to include us. And, but at the same time, it does have to be reasonable for the employer because generally when large corporations are looking for employees, 
you know, it's because there's a job that they need filled. <laughs> they don't just create jobs for different communities. There are actually jobs that need to be done at the, the job. So I, you, I continue to say that word because it's mis, been misused in our community. But I think now is a time when we all have to be very deliberate about looking to hire women, looking to hire black and brown, looking to hire qualified people with disabilities across the board. Um, so it, it's a very interesting times, but I, I think I, the word always keeps coming to my mind, being very deliberate um, about what we're doing. That's really interesting that you say that, Deborah. And I have to say, I, you know, I, I absolutely concur. When you say being deliberate, and looking at those who have these qualifications. Um, are you saying that on the one hand, actually, it's kind of, it's not okay just to look to those who have got disabilities and expect them to solve society's problems? Because that's not okay either. You know, mm -hmm. when the terrible, tragic murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so, so many others happened, we had organizations who, with good will, would say, well, need to speak to someone who is black, basically. And you kind of, it makes you kind of, makes me just shrink a little bit actually saying that because I think, oh my goodness, well, why are we looking to the black individuals to solve that problem? You know, right. why, why? Because I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not black. I can't understand how it would feel as a black person experiencing that. If someone puts their head above the parapet, and the same with disability, someone puts their head above the parapet and says, hey, I really want to help and everything like that, but don't just look to those who happen to have the life experience and expect that they would solve that problem is, I think, what you're trying to say, i.e. I have dyslexia, but am I trained in how to ensure those with other invisible disabilities can thrive in the workforce? No, I'm absolutely not. Do not come to me about it. It's hard enough dealing with it myself. And so, um, and I've gone this about this in a roundabout way, Deborah, trying to explain, um, but it, it, it really does resonate. It is that it's the, the, the deliberate nature whilst also ensuring that actually you are doing the best for these communities, not just hoping and praying um, that it will get sorted because we need to tick that box, basically. Well said. And let me, let me just to add, to what you just said, uh, Layla, it, it is always interesting to me how oftentimes communities that have been oppressed and or, or have been discriminated against are called upon to solve the problem of oppression and discrimination, when the truth is they are not the ones who actually created the problem. They are not the ones where the, that, that's not where the problem resides. What ends up happening is their lives are impacted as a result of discrimination or oppression. So really the oppressor or the discriminator needs to be the one to fix that particular problem. And in the area of employment, there are qualified people with disabilities in every single industry known to man, even those that have not been created as of yet. So the discrimination or the, or, or, or the lack of employment is not based on the fact of can't find any qualified people or there are no people who have the skill set. That's not the truth at all. But the truth is, are you looking in the right places or are you creating the environment where this individual can thrive and allow them to solve the problem that you're hiring to solve in the first place? And so it must be a collective. I, I am a firm believer that we are not a monolith, that we are bound more tightly together by the strengths of our diversities, by those dissimilarities that really bind us together. Because it is my unique perspective that gives you the ability to reach into a market that you would otherwise have not had. It is your unique perspective that gives me guidance in an area that I may not have the experience in, but because you do, I can rely on that. And that is where we find our strength. 
That is how we move the needle forward. So we have to get out of the mindset of, oh, that's their problem. That's their thing. They need to figure that out and really realize that it's us. There's nobody else. It's us. It's us. There is no point preaching to the converted. We must bring others onto the journey. Does self-actualization exist? I'm not sure, but we must continue onwards and upwards and recognize that this is a living, breathing, sleeping thing, right? You know, it, it's something which is always changing. It's something that is always evolving. And I'm already now really excited to hear the news from you both because I watch what you do with admiration. You are there living breathing, sleeping, what it is that you do, and changing the face of corporate America and beyond. And we at Dial are so thrilled to be part of that journey because there are no two better experts who really are qualified, to use your uh, terminology, Deborah, in disability inclusion, both visible and invisible, as a superpower and as a strength. So tell me, tell me, what is the news I'm dying to hear? Well, I, I will start <clears throat> and then turn it over to LaMondre. So I, another, I've been doing this work, working with global corporations all over the United, all over the United States and around the world for since early 2000s, as we've said, and we work with the customers from employment, from the perspective of you need to hire people with disabilities in your employment, but you need to retain them and promote them and train them. But also from the client perspective, you need to make sure your customers have full access to everything that you're selling, your, your servicing, your, you know, your websites, your apps, and many of your um, customers have disabilities, whether they disclose them to you or not. And then, of course, we do it from the third lens of your brand. How is your brand talking about the community and dis diversity and inclusion in an empowering way? But I see a lot of efforts being made. I see what Dial Global is doing to make sure you're looking at corporations are looking at 10 intersections of diversity and inclusion. I see what the Valuable 500 is doing, bringing 500 CEOs together. I see what national organizations like Disability In or Business Disability Forum, who introduced us, Leila, um, are doing to make sure that corporations are prepared and ready to really make sure that people with disabilities are included. But there's something that I'm not seeing that worries me. And um, what I'm seeing is that our community is not coming together. Now we have over a billion people with disabilities, according to the World Health Organization. And some people feel it's much higher in the States, for example, according to our CDC, one in four Americans, adult Americans identify as having disabilities. One in four in the UK, one in five. In Europe, one in five. In Canada, one in five. Um, but so the numbers are staggering, but then we see these weird conversations that are happening that, well, Layla, you have dysle dyslexia. Deborah, you have ADHD, which, by the way, is defined as a disability under the Americans with Disability Act and the Convention of the Rights for Persons with Disabilities. But people won't self-identify because they're afraid, for good reasons, that you'll discriminate against them. So they won't identify. And so a lot of the discrimination is actually happening to people with physical disabilities, but at the same time, our community has not come together in a powerful, meaningful way. And so I, um, I had one of my clients actually give me this idea and they said, Deborah, you should create the International Association of Professionals with Disabilities. And I just loved it. And I thought, that is such a great idea. Where are the Lamandres, the, Le the Laylas, the Debras that will, for the visible and hidden, come out and talk about our lived experiences, which are so powerful. And, and then I thought about it more and I got the team involved. And uh, we have decided, and we are actually doing this, we have created a nonprofit and is um, the new name is Billion Strong because there's over a billion people with disabilities in the world and you start including the caregivers, the ones that love them, and the numbers go higher and higher. And LaMondre Pugh is going to be the CEO of that nonprofit because representation matters. Who better? Yes, I know. I'm so excited too, Leila. <laughs> 
But <laughs> this is about identity and empowerment, identifying who we are, but then also coming out and owning who we are. Because how can Dial Global help the corporations be, you know, successful at including people with disabilities if they don't know where they are? So let me turn it over to Lamandre to comment. I think it's obvious why Lamandre is should be in this position. <laughs> Congratulations, Lamondre. That Thank is you. Thank amazing. You so much. I, amazing. I'm excited. I'm, 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 I'm so excited about this because this is the opportunity now um, to really create a movement where we can stand as a community of people with disabilities globally and say we are here and we are strong and we bring value. And the other side of that is it allows us to represent to the world for the world to see us as a unified, strong voice. And, and I have a dear friend that always says, let's take this moment and make it a movement. And I believe that that's what we're about right now, taking this moment and making it a movement. And I am honored, humbled, and thrilled at the same time. Uh, to be able to lead this effort. So I'm. Um... And Layla, I, I, I'll, to, 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 Lamandre reminded me of something else. I see often, I, first of all, let me just say, I love being an American. I am so proud to be a United States citizen. I love it. But there are things in my country I am not pleased with. And I, let's just say I'm pleased with, with my current president. I'll just say that. But there, there's a lot of things that are happening in the States that, that I don't like. And so I've really thought about, okay, well, if you don't like it, how, how, do, you, how do you really solve these problems? But um, often what I see happening in the States, and the UK is a little guilty of this too, is that we will create something that we say is a global movement, but it won't really be global. It'll just be all the States. And then, you know, we didn't want to do that. We did not do, want to do that with Billion Strong. So I have gone out and I have gotten multiple major leaders, partnerships in India, in China, in Brazil, in Central America, in Latin America, in MENA. Uh, we, we, and we are be, we're actually being more deliberate about including those partners. Dow Global obviously is a partner with us to make sure our community comes together in a real empowering way and that we are, that we're coaching each other and that we are, you know, we're, we're providing professional development and we're providing mentoring, but mentoring from someone, what if you, you know, you know, Lamandre is a little boy and everybody that mentoring are mentoring him. If he even gets mentorship, they're not the same color as him. They don't have a disability. It really, really does matter for leaders to look to for us to have diverse leaders. And so doing it from a global lens to take care of our brothers and sisters, non-binary, all of that stuff from a global perspective and not just looking at it from a developed world perspective, we think is critical. We also know that it, it's going to be, we're going to um, do memberships and fellows and awards and stuff like that, but it's not going to be paid members because we want we want those billion people with disabilities to come out and own this. And then all the corporations and the employers and the dial globals can find our community. It, this started, there, there's a lot of things that started, but when the CEO of Wells Fargo back during in 2020 said that he couldn't find the talent to promote black and brown people. He couldn't find them. Right. Well, and everybody got really mad about that comment, but the, the little secret is that you can't find the Lamandres of the world because now that I'm so blessed that Lamandre works for my company and now he is going to be the CEO of Billion Strong, but where are the Lamandres? And I've, we, Lamandre and I've talked about this a lot, but once again, who's, is it society's responsibility to encourage Lamandre to come out or is it the community's, you know, but um, let me turn it over to you, Lamandre, too. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I believe it's all of us. I believe it's all of us. I believe that it's all of us. This is this for me, billion strong for me is the convergent point. It is the point where 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 we all intersect and where we can really move the needle forward. So while it is a huge challenge that is before us, I know that we can do it and I know that we will do it. It's going to take some time, it's going to take some work and it's going to take real commitment from not only 
the community of people with disabilities, but it's also going to take the commitment from organizations and corporations that support and purport to support people with disabilities. And, and, and I know we can do this. I know that we can move this forward. Huge congratulations to both of you. And the team and I at Dial, I'm speaking on their behalf here, I know are going to be so, so overjoyed to hear this news. We feel proud to be associated with two and many other change-making leaders who truly care. Because when you strip back everything else and you, you kind of, you know, you realize that everyone's only here for a finite amount of time and we're all flesh and blood and, and, and that's it. Actually what matters, what really truly matters is collaboration and not competition and leaving this world in a better place than which we found it leaving a positive legacy for those future generations of leaders to actually make a deeper mark for good and i i just commend you both on all that you are doing i think the balance that you have is I want to say perfection, but I know neither of you will be satisfied with even the word perfection. You'll be saying, Layla, but, but, but why and what else can we do? It is that unrest. Um, and I have it myself is you just want to really make a difference. And, you know, I would really encourage anyone who is listening to, to really, you know, reach out. You know, these two and their organization is incredible. I feel very, very proud to be part of um, a Bill in Strong. And I, I give thanks for the fact that there are people who want to drive this globally as we do. And I can't wait for many of our members and those that tune into our summits, which we'll be at very soon, will be able to learn more about this because it's everyone isn't it it's bringing everyone together and you know, I love the title by the way as well that's brilliant Thank billion you. strong it is it's so strong it's so powerful and when are we getting this on a t-shirt I'm feeling like hashtag <laughs> hashtag billion strong sorry I actually knocked over my microphone and then I was like it's out of the way um hashtag billion strong is I want my t-shirt can I have it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are so excited because the community hasn't really come together. In a, the, the community definitely has come together in pockets. But could we come together to support each other and to support society? And actually, if we, this is the supply part of that demand that's been being built by what you're doing, what Rue Global Impact's doing, what the Valuable 500s, what the, so many others are doing. But we do have to have the supply part. You know, uh, it was unfortunate this, the Wells Fargo. Fargo CEO said that about African Americans because actually there are definitely is a supply yeah. that is he not was, a supply. He, he was being, he, they didn't look. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, but and the, yeah, the, there was, yeah, and people were able to tell him where to look, which is good. But honestly, for our community, we're in pockets, we're in pockets, and we're such a big community. We have invisible, we have visible, we have uh, mental illness, we have mental health. I mean, we, we're ju it's gigantic. And often people will say, well, oh, you're not really disabled if you have ADHD or dyslexia, for example. But the laws say that that is part of it. So if it isn't part of it, we need to change our legal definitions. If it is part of it, how, Layla, do we get people to come out like you and talk about your lived experience with dyslexia? How do you get someone like me to come out and say, well, you know, obviously I'm over a certain age, but I also ADHD, I was diagnosed much later in life. And I have people sometimes saying, well, but dyslexic, people that are dyslexic and have ADHD were always part of the workforce. Okay, I get it. I agree with you. We, we weren't always able to come out with our lived experiences, embrace who we are. We, we were fearful to talk to our employers about maybe talking about accommodation, accommodations that would make us more productive and innovative and creative. But the people that have truly been left out are people that have physical disabilities like LaMondre. Um, LaMondre, now people know about LaMondre and they want him. You know, I've already had major corporations come after him and I'm like, no, don't go for, I mean, no, I'm sorry. Yes, do what's right <laughs> for you. 
no, that's right. <laughs> Cause you're torn. I don't want to le- lose such a talented man, but you don't lose your, your team members if you continue to promote them. So now he's the CEO of Billion Strong. And I think we all need to, you know, do whatever we can to support him to be successful. But there's something beautiful about a community coming together to take care of themselves, to empower and embrace and, and to help each other instead of always looking at others and saying, well, I don't know why you won't help me. So uh, we'll help ourselves so that society can help us and employers can be more successful, including us. Deborah and Lamondre, thank you ever so much for for being here and for doing what it is that you do. I am proud to be associated with Billion Strong. I am proud that the Mackenzie Dallas Review and Dial Global are able to support in moving the dial on a year by year, month by month, day by day, minute by minute basis. And I can't wait to see you both again very soon. I would absolutely love for those who are tuning into the show today to reach out to Deborah, to reach out to Lamondre, um, to make sure you check out the fantastic work they're doing and um, and really consider some of the, the top tips that we've learned uh, from the uh, from the session today i'd also say uh, as well when it comes to uh, accessibility and it comes to doing what is right um you know there is a, a a constant learning curve you know we are learning a lot um working with deborah and lamondre you know we're trying to um make sure um we make our app even more successful and so you know don't uh, don't be fearful of of this as a subject matter just be fearful about not doing something soon enough if you have missed anything from today's session it'll all be on demand you can check us out at dialglobal.org forward slash podcast you can see all of the show notes and all the contact details as well so you can rewind you can repeat as many times as you want <laughs> My name is Layla McKenzie Dallas. I'm the founder and CEO of Dial Global and of the McKenzie Dallas Foundation. And I've been joined today by, I keep saying it, but two phenomenal individuals. They are going places. They are talented individuals. So hear and see them for all that they are. Um, Deborah Roux, Lamondre, well, Lamondre, now CEO of Billion Strong. Thank you for being here. You've been listening to the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast show. Make sure you're not a stranger and do reach out and stay in touch. But until next time, take care and we'll see you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below. Or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.